now, I'm in a company called T-Wear. So we make a product called a T-Jacket. So this jacket is a wearable technology that has airbags on the inside. You can control it with your smartphone and the airbags will inflate and give you a virtual, like a hard light sensation. So um, today I'm not going to be talking too much about these two companies. Uh, I'll be talking to you about, uh, it's more like a sharing session today. So a bit more introduction about myself. I'm 28 this year. So what I'll be speaking about today will be all the experiences and journey in digital marketing. So um, I've done a lot of stupid things when I was uh, doing digital marketing. So I hope to today be able to value add you guys by telling you exactly what I did wrong. And hopefully you don't have the same mistake as me. So what happens next? I tried to build my own websites. So I've, um, these two websites are almost no longer existent. Yahoo Geo Cities and Angel Fire. It is one of those places whereby you can build free websites um, about 10 years or 15 years ago. So with that, I, I started building a lot of interesting websites and I came across this very interesting thing called Google AdSense. So what exactly is Google AdSense? Google AdSense is all those annoying ads that you see on websites, whereby when you click on it, the website is actually making money. It's making 20 cents, 30 cents, up to maybe say two, three dollars per click. So I was like, wow, I can make money with this skill set. I can make money through uh, web building. And that became the start of my digital marketing journey. So it was exhilarating. It, I managed to drive a lot of traffic, did a lot of wrong things. At, um, when I'm trying to market my website, I did all the, I would say black hat things. So it's all the mistakes that Anybody can make, I was, I was really young, I was in NS around 21 years old, before I entered university. After a while, my Google AdSense account was banned, and that's, that's it, I can no longer make money on websites. So what happened next, I went into um, NUS, so I graduated from NUS Business School. Um, I didn't have very good grades when I was in school. I was very not focused. So if you can see over here, is this a laser pointer? Okay, yeah. You realize that my cap score is only 2.1. So if anybody here that is worried about your cap score, don't worry, you know, everything is going to be fine. So if you can see, this is the last semester of my NUS school. I took 10 modules. It was so crazy. How can anybody take 10 modules in one sem? I just really wanted to graduate really badly. Okay, so um, what was I distracted with in my NUS life? Um, I created two companies. One is called Y Ideas, one is called Unlimited Host. Um, I wanted to use my skills to make some money. So what I did is a web development company. Unlimited Host is a web hosting. So I um, went out, I applied for a job, and I joined Angel's Gates. Angel's Gates is a TV show. Um, it's very similar to Shark's Tank or Dragon's Den. It's whereby entrepreneurs will pitch to four judges, and the four judges will uh, give funding to them. So this was at on Channel News Asia in about 2011-2012. After that, I left to join Pirate3D in December 2012. Okay, so now to the good stuff. Okay, what's the deal today? What, it, what am I gonna give to you guys? I've done the wrong things, I've made the stupid mistakes. So I'm just gonna spoon feed you guys all the concepts, the learning points and the examples. If you can note them down, please note them down because I won't be releasing the slides. Okay, next, what makes a great marketer? Okay, I split this, down, split this down into three parts. The first part that makes a great marketer is you can read between the lines. Next, you have to get exposed. Exposed to what? I'll be explaining on that more later. And the third part is you have to create your own luck. There's a lot of people that say, I'm very lucky to have you know, done these kind of weird things and get these kind of results. But Sometimes you have to create your own luck. How do you do it? I'm going to cover it in a bit. Okay, so read between the lines. One very good way that you can learn and hone this skill is look at ads. Look at ads are everywhere and they are a very good teacher. What you want to do is you want to look at what is the message, what is the copy that this ad is writing about. And you see, oh, there's this nice lady. You know, she's holding a nice watch. You know, she's in this anger and she's smiling or something like that. So why? Why all these things? Why is it a nice lady? Why is this bling bling watch? Or maybe say like Pandora? So what is the app trying to invoke? 
as in it is emotion that what what is it trying to bring out in you and then how will you as a consumer take action so you really need to drill down try and understand what is the marketer trying to do what is the advertiser that is running this advertisement trying to do and you do this on a daily basis you don't just do this when you are like um when you want to this should be kind of like an obsession this is an obsession of mine i go around i look at ads i look at um, maybe say Dobigot MRT station. The whole MRT station is always plastered with ads. Why? You know, why, why that ad? Why that color? Why that person? You know, what are they trying to say? So, um, next, uh, browse the papers, go to events. When I say go to events, um, these events are like those kind of forex trading events, investment trading, stock tradings, and then um, how to get rich quick. You know, those kind of blogging kind of... Uh, Sounds a bit scammy, you have no idea whether are they trying to cheat money or not. But go to those events, provided they are free. I don't want you to pay money for that. What you should learn at those events is not what they are selling, but how are they selling it. Because how is more important than what. If you know how they're doing it, you can reapply that into something else. If they're selling a forex course, you can sell another course, no problem. You just need to know how they do it. So how is he speaking? Is he speaking with confidence? Is he not? Is he like hiding behind a desk? Or is he, how is he generating leads? Was your experience good at this particular event? Note down the good parts and then remember the bad because the bad is the ones that you do not want to do. Okay, so read between the lines on a daily basis so that you can learn every day. Your teacher is all around you. It's all the advertisements that you are seeing on a daily basis. Next thing, how about retail? Can you learn anything from a retail store? If you're walking into LV, how do they position their storefront? This is about retail marketing. It's not just digital, but this is about retail. So how are you seeing they are, I would say, arranging their storefront? How do they expect the consumer to go? All these are very important things that you should think about and observe on a daily basis in every single store. In a shopping mall, you know, you'll realize that, oh my God, this floor is so difficult to navigate. Yeah, that's why you don't want in your store next time if you're ever gonna create a retail store. So all these are learning points on a daily basis. Okay, um, next, before I jump to point two, the fundamentals of digital marketing and conventional marketing are very similar. Okay, but what's the difference? Execution, tools, and the KPI. KPI means uh, key performance index, and it is exactly what you should measure at, um, okay, as in, it's what you should measure. So, let me give you an example. For a retail store and a website, how would you measure the number of traffic? Yeah, for a retail store, you get someone to just click on a clicker while people are coming in to the shopping mall or the shopping uh, retail store. But for a website, you're going to use a different execution method. You're going to use a different tool and you're going to measure very different things. Because in a retail store, if customers are coming in, they are browsing your goods and then they look at the cashier. Ah, the queue is so long. I don't, I don't have time to queue so long. You know? What happens next? The store manager can very easily open up another point of sales. And that solves the problem. But if you run a website, somebody goes to your website and they experience a problem, how do you identify that problem? You have no, it's a different set of tools to identify whether it's somebody adding to cart and then after that realizing, oh, it's so hard for me to check out. Or are they getting stuck at a payment page? Is it very hard for them to pay? Are you making life difficult for them? Is that too many steps? Or is it like a one page checkout? So you can't really find, um, you can't really identify the problem if you don't have the right tools for digital marketing. So um, I took a website, for example, in this case. Okay, so how do you solve this problem? You need to get exposed. So the number one obstacle to becoming a great digital marketer is to not know what you don't know. Because if you don't know what you don't know, you cannot improve that, you see? So um, I have a two-step process. It's very simple. It's very easy to remember. It's very easy to learn. Shotgun learning, laser training. What do I mean by that? The shotgun has a lot of pellets. When you fire it out, it just goes boom, white area. So this is what you should be thinking of when you are learning. So the digital, digital marketing course for Litton, um, they cover a broad range of topics, which is good because you need that broad knowledge. But when you are going to focus to become a digital marketer, you should pick a specialization that you want to drill into 
so that you can understand and apply, and you become that master at this particular tool. What do I mean by this particular tool or methodology? It means like uh, some people might be interested in search engine optimization. Some might be interested in search engine marketing. Some might be social media marketing. There's so many things under the digital marketing tree. So this is a very brief um, map of what is in digital marketing. You have pay-per-click, you have um, writing, copywriting, websites, press releases, social media, email marketing, so on and so forth. There's so many things in digital marketing. Under the digital marketing umbrella, there's so many things that you can learn, you can do. And if you see that SEO is just one small bubble, but that one small bubble can be, I would say, a lot of work, a lot of mastery is involved in just SEO, although it's just a tiny dot over there. So this is the exposure that you should see yourself. You should touch a little bit about everything so that when you are planning a campaign, you can take all of this into consideration. So I would say this is a very brief chart because I found something even scarier. This is called the digital marketing transit. You realize it looks like an MRT train map because it is a transit map for digital marketing. Um, yep. Okay, moving on. The third point on how to be a great marketer, you need to get lucky. So I was speaking, Lydia actually shot me an email earlier today and she was saying that, wow, you know, there's so much to learn about digital marketing. It's like change is constant, which is true. In digital marketing, change is constant. That's why I don't like to teach tools, but I like to teach mindsets because mindset is going to get you so much further, you know, in digital marketing. And um, execution methods differ from industry. So there's no one good way to teach digital marketing. There is one good way to learn digital marketing. Okay? So why do I say it's different? So B2B and B2C execution methods for digital marketing is very different. One, you're talking to consumers. Another one, you're talking to businesses. So there's a lot of difference there. Which one should you focus on? Maybe B2B, you want to work more on your LinkedIn profiles. You want to work more on your LinkedIn um, company page. B2C, probably more on Facebook and Twitter because you want to have that engagement with your consumers. Next thing, even if it's B2C, there's so many segments. There's FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods. All your shampoos, all your daily consumables, your toothpaste, your toothbrush, fast-moving consumable goods. And then there's electronics. So different. How would you market a shampoo different from maybe say a Samsung S6, you know? It's very different. So what used to work usually doesn't work anymore in, I would say, two to five years. Digital marketing is a very fast-paced um, market. So you have to create your own luck. So what do I mean by that? You have to experiment all the time, measure what comes out of this experiment, and then learn from them. You have to analyze those numbers and then um, try and learn from them. To expand on what I mean by create your own luck, um, let's go for an interview. So at a job interview, who do you think is the product? Yourself. It's yourself. You are, the, you are the product. You are trying to sell yourself to the hiring manager. Who is the buyer? The hiring manager. So what are you selling? Are you selling yourself? Do you promote a good brand? You know, um, do you have the required skill sets? Are you feeling that need that the hiring manager wants? So how do you increase your chance? How do you create that luck yourself? Well, you can read out on the company. You can put on a tie and a suit. It makes your packaging look good, right? And then reading out on the company and understanding the position. You can craft that unique value proposition to the hiring manager. The hiring manager is going to be like, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. He fits the bill correctly. Right? You can find out more about the hiring manager. Maybe on LinkedIn you see, oh, hobbies, cats and sailing. All of a sudden on that day, you like cats and sailing too. That might increase your chance a little bit, you see? So um, print and bring your CV. This is actually something I always tell my friends. It's something not relevant, but if you print and bring your own CV, you print it on a thicker paper, you bind it up, it looks very nice. You go into the interview and you give it to the hiring manager. Wow, so different. Every, probably the hiring manager already prints it out by himself already. He has this A4 stack of paper of all the interviewees. But you come in and you give him that, wow, binded, thick paper, colored. When he puts it at the end of the day, your resume, your CV is going to stand up from the stack. And that's what makes you different. So always try and be a little bit uh, remarkable, be a bit different. And then you can propose changes. So all these things are things that you can do to increase your chances. 
So always look for ways that you can create your own luck. Because people that are going to go through all this trouble are going to be the lucky people in the world. Not because they are lucky, but because they work and create that luck. Yep, this is just a mini example that I want to say that that guy in the jeans and shirt is not going to do as well as the guy in the suit. So you have to create your own luck, put in the extra effort, especially in digital marketing, and you realize that that bit of luck is going to make all the difference and make you stand out from the rest. Okay, part two. Wow, been talking about a bit of time. Anyway, um, common pitfalls in marketing. So this is part two, the bad. So I'm going to talk about bad things now. Um, feature marketing, selling to everyone, and hooks, but no loops. What do I mean by all this? It sounds very mysterious. So feature marketing, features of a product, things that people don't care. This is at least in my opinion. Why? Because why would I care what is in my shampoo? What is the ingredient? It has this chemical, it has that chemical. I don't care. I want to know if my shampoo is going to make my hair silky smooth. I want to know if my shampoo is going to make my life better. Is it make, making it smell better. So all these are benefits. Benefits will sell. Features will not. So don't get hung up on selling features of your product. Sell the benefits because it's relatable. If it's relatable and relevant, it will in evoke emotion. And emotion is what influences people to buy, to take action. Okay, so always remember, sell the benefit, not the features. If you want to talk about features, you talk about it after the benefit. And um, last point, sell the hope. Okay, sell the end goal, sell the end game. So what do I mean by sell the hope? 4D and Toto is hope. People are buying it. They know that they're not going to strike. Very likely, they're not going to strike. But why are people still paying their hard-earned money into 4D, Toto, Big Sweep? Because there's that hope. I'll talk about the benefit first. This is a tasty drink. It helps to improve your digestive system. Now, here's why. You know, it is a very different kind of, um, I would say, emotion invoked when you are talking about benefits first. Because it's relatable and it's relevant to people. Okay, next. What is the bad thing about selling to everyone? When you're selling to everyone, you are selling to no one. The reason why is because you cannot be all things to all people and we are trying to sell to everyone. You are, you are crafting a very generic message because you want to target everyone. You have to have a very generic message and you will have a weak value proposition because of that and that is going to cause low conversion. Um, I'm going to bring your attention to the picture that I have um, at the bottom. You realize that you have head and shoulders, you have pumpkin, you know, it's going to make your hair silky smooth. You have herbal essence, you have Ole shampoo also. This is like five shampoos. They are all run by the same parent company. Do you know that? They are all run by P&G. So why doesn't P&G just come up with one shampoo and just say that this magical shampoo can solve all your problems? It doesn't. It says that head and shoulders is good for dandruff. You know, Pantene, silky smooth. Herbal essence is very natural, you know. So it comes up with so many brands just to target that individual segment so that it doesn't sell to everyone. It targets the exact segment. So maybe for Ole, it will be more towards the beauty, kind of, beauty side of things. So if a big company is doing it, you should also be doing this. Always segment and then target your niche, drill it down, and then you'll see the conversion increase. Okay, so part three, what is bad? Hooks but not loops. What do I mean by that? See, everybody always has a very, um, I would say, very normal magic plan on digital marketing. You spend money on advertising, you bring people to your website, but you expect your ROI, your return on investment to be positive, but I don't know why, it's still negative. So there's a lot of times whereby it is not just that magic plan. Oh, I'm just going to throw money until the money bounce back and more money bounce back. No, it doesn't happen that way. What happens is sometimes you have a leaky bucket so what do I mean by a leaky bucket? It could be like just now, you're talking about features, you're not talking about benefits. So there are people that are just leaving your website after they come in. So you are just wasting that, you are wasting that money, you are wasting that traffic that is coming in. Some people, you have uh, no call to action. What do I mean by call to action? Call to action is like a, if you are running a clinic, you're a doctor, you're running a clinic, your call to action should be book an appointment with us now. You know, it should be, oh, register for a place, and uh, you are calling people to take action. Some websites, they do not have a clear call to action. Consumers just, I would say, navigate around and then they just leave. 
not doing anything. They're like, oh yeah, this website is very informative. Thank you so much and bye. You know, that's, that's, that's what just happens. So next is um, virality does not happen if the infrastructure is in, isn't in place for it to happen. So if you do not have the infrastructure ready in place, like say for example, at the end of the consumer experience map, when, you are, when someone enters your website, what if the call to action is a uh, newsletter subscription? At the end of the newsletter subscription, when somebody press OK, I will sign up, what happens next? A lot of times, a lot of websites, it is just, that's the end, there's nothing else. But what if you can create a loop, which means to say, when somebody says, um, this is my email, I click subscribe. And then another email comes along and says that, hi, thank you for subscribing. You might want to find out more about our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter, you know, so and so forth. There is a loop. It's not just sign up, thanks for signing up. You know, that's it, no more. That is the end of it. What you realize is the longer a consumer browses your website, the more likely they are to spend money on you because they are investing time. Okay? So if you invest time, you are more likely to put your money and your cash down. So next, um, black hat marketing. I'm sure nobody has ever talked about this before because it's not even taught. It is something that I've came across myself and I feel that it is so important that people get exposed to this. This is something that is um, sometimes frowned upon because what is black hat marketing? Black hat marketing is very often unethical. It's frowned upon, it's illegal, and it might be offensive to other people. So what do I mean by offensive? By offensive, I mean that you are going to cause harm and pain to another business owner. So why do I want to talk about black hat marketing? You know, it's like the elephant in the room. Everyone knows it, no one talks about it. So what do I mean by black hat marketing? At the very surface level, um, it is about email lists, SEO links. What do I mean by all these check marks that you see? All these are things that you can buy with money. You don't need to be a real product, it doesn't matter. You can buy all of these things. You can buy an email list, um, say for example, just a few days ago, you might have heard about Property Guru, iProperty and maybe 99.co. All these three are property websites. So what is that common trait about property agents that um, I've identified? Okay. Property agents love to put their phone number and their emails down and their full name so that people can contact them. But what does it mean to me? It means that it's very easy for me to collect the data of every single property agent in Singapore. I have their first name, last name, I have their email addresses and I have their phone number. So if one day I have something that I can sell to these guys, or I know there's someone else that wants to sell things to property agents, I can do that. I can sell them the email list. So this is something black hat. I um, don't think anybody should do it, but this is the example that I'm giving. Okay, so other things that you can buy in the black, I would say black markets of the internet, is like Facebook likes, you have Twitter followers, YouTube views, and Amazon reviews. So that you can create that false sense of credibility on the internet space, they will increase your sales um, just that much. Okay, um, so why do I want to talk about this? Because I want to expose everyone to black hat marketing. Um, because the one thing is there's no marketing police out there that is going to regulate the ecosystem. So if you're going to be encountering these kind of people, you might as well know kind of um, what are they doing, you know, that this exists, you should be wary of, and be in the know, just be in the know. And at least if you want to do black hat marketing, like if you want to buy Facebook fans or you want to buy Twitter followers, at least you know what else not to do, okay? So um, it's kind of like a defense again against the dark arts also. If somebody were to do an offensive um, black hat marketing technique towards you, um, you can take note and prepare for these kind of things. Okay, the reason why people do this kind of thing is because of results. Okay, every single little action is going to increase their chances. So there's no such thing as 0%. They are going to help their results, their sales. Okay, so let's go into some examples. Okay, Facebook and Twitter followers. So, um, okay, it's all about manipulation sometimes in the marketing space. Um, 
This is something that is kind of debated out there. You know, what is marketing actually? Is it just manipulation? What is Coca-Cola doing? It's trying to manipulate everyone to buy gassy sweet drinks. If you think about it, it's true. So is it really like a manipulation technique? So in black hat um, kind of marketing, there's a lot of this kind of manipulation going around. around. So when you buy Facebook and Twitter followers, what are you doing? You're actually doing a social engineering technique because that people, are, people have hurt instincts and sometimes require social validation before they, make an, um, before they make a purchase. So consumers reference each other when they are buying things and they don't fact check. People just assume, wow, this page has 50,000 likes, must be legit. I'm gonna like it too and subscribe to the updates. So this is my Twitter page. Um, I don't actively use my Twitter. If you can see, it's, the last post is on May 28th. But I have 260,000 followers. It's not something that I'm trying to brag, but I have been testing a lot on my own personal account, this kind of black hat skills, and I have this kind of followers. But what is interesting is that I have received so many emails of people thinking that I'm a real influencer. So when Twitter first came to Singapore to run their advertising campaigns, they were like, oh, Titan, can you come and speak at our event? Do you know, I was so embarrassed. I was like, wow, do you know all those are fake? Like, <laughs> it's like, I have been, my friends are people who sell these kind of followers and likes. So I was like, yeah, hey bro, help me out. You know, give me some followers, like just for fun. And they're like, oh, okay, sure, 260K. And I get really legitimate people who are like, hey, I'm having this event, why don't you come? You can be the VIP, just tweet about us when we are at the event camp ready. And half the, okay, 100% of the time, I was too embarrassed to even go. Because, yeah, maybe I should try and exploit that. But that's the thing, people do not fact check. If your numbers are high enough, some people just like, wow, must be legit, you know? Maybe before coming to the event, you'll be like, oh, this guy must be good, man. 260K followers, more than Xiaoxue and Mr. Brown. You know? But sometimes it is just on a surface value. Okay, next, YouTube rank hacking. So this is another black hat technique. Sometimes your videos, you know, you are coming out with a new product and you want to rank for a certain keyword. Say, I'll just give a real example. Um, Pirate 3D, when we are coming out with our Kickstarter campaign, we wanted to rank for the keyword 3D printer. So what we did was, sorry, what I did was, I just bought a ton of views, I bought a ton of ratings, I bought a ton of favorites and activities. What are activities? Comments. So what you realize is, the more comments and likes that you have on the Facebook, uh, sorry, YouTube video, the higher you rank for that particular keyword. So for the full period of our campaign, all I spent was $50, but I, our video was ranking top five for the keyword 3D printer. That's how easy it is to game the system then. I think it's a little bit different now, so um, very probably you'll need to go and um, find out. I'll, I'll tell you where, where to find out about these kind of things later. You'll see different web assets like social networks, um, WordPress pages, forum profiles, so and so forth. Essentially, you just want to build as much links to your money site as possible. So this is one of the black hat techniques. And there are softwares out there that let you easily build these kind of links. Every single box that you see, right, is actually about 300 plus links that is linking to your website. And you, what you want to do is you want to build authority to those links as, as well. So that um, there's a thing called the link juice. When they pass the link juice up, your website is going to be the one that is um, ranking the highest. The reason why is because Google thinks that the more links to your website, the more relevant your content is. Although this might be factored in at a lower weightage right now, but it still holds true. If you have content and links that are linking to you, that is relevant to your keyword, you'll rank for that keyword. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the software can do a lot more. Okay, so what I want you to know is that there are tools out there there are strategies, there are methods out there that people are, they don't even know exist. So this is the kind of things that you should expose yourself to if you want to go into digital marketing. You don't have to do them, but you should at least know that how is your competitor beating you to the game. Okay? So you might think that this is the link diagram that is the more complicated one, but actually no. There is actually even more complicated things out there. Because what you realize is if your consumer can find you, they can pay you. 
if you are on page 5, nobody's going to care. You're just going to burn and die. So in the black hat marketing space, it's very competitive. Okay, this is the most complicated one that I found already. And there are others whereby it is so many layers deep, I can't even um, make sense of that picture. Okay, so this is what I want you guys to be able to think about and expose yourself to when you are embarking on digital marketing. Um, that's black hat marketing. There's another term that I'm going to coin today. It's something really new. I call it mafia marketing. Mafia marketing is like gangsters, you know. Like, what, what, what happens in mafia marketing? You start fires in your competitor's company so much that it dilutes the competitor's resources. It can be time, it can be money. These are the two most important resources for any company. Okay, so um, I'll quickly touch on everyone. There's a thing called spam trap out there. Spam traps are email addresses that are all over the internet that, um, that these spam trap owners hope to get spammers come into this um, spam trap. So say for example, if I have titan at spamtrap.com, I'll put my email everywhere on the internet. And when there are people harvesting these kind of email addresses, like how I'm harvesting like maybe say property gurus, uh, property agent um, email addresses, I pick up this spam trap email address. And when I market to this spam trap email address, I get um, blacklisted instantaneously. The thing is, what if you use this spam trap email and you subscribe to your competitor's uh, newsletter? Your competitor is going to send a real newsletter not intended for spam, into a spam trap. And that is going to trigger a spam trap uh, spam notice. And that will cause that competitor's domain to be blacklisted. From then on, what happens? You know, every single email that your competitor sends out is going to be into the spam box. They, they won't even make it into the inbox anymore. So this is something that is um, a little bit technical, but it's out there. It is something that um, some people do to each other, you know. Okay, then next thing is data contamination. What do I mean by data contamination? If Facebook likes and Twitter followers are so easy to buy, can you buy them for your competitors? Can. You buy them from all over the world and then you send them to your competitors. What happens next? Your competitors have no idea, you know, which are real, which are fake. And that is going to contaminate their data so much that they have no idea which is their true customers that are engaging with them. And because of that, they cannot make decisions in an informative way that will benefit their company. So this happens the same for site traffic. You can buy traffic to your competitor site from all over the world and they're like, oh my god, why is like some weird country coming to my website so much? You know, and if they are a website that sells traffic, eh, sorry, that sells ads, you know, maybe say like hardware zone or um, Hungry go where they have ads on their website. If you drive this kind of weird traffic to their website, how are they going to show their advertisers? You know, this is my traffic record. But then what you realize is everything is from Afghanistan or, or India. It's like a very weird traffic source. No offense to these two countries. But essentially, it is just to create that fire for that particular company that they have to constantly fight fire and not focus on business. Um, next thing that you can do is you can flood support lines. You can just use their support email address and sign up for every single service that you can think of on the internet. And then instantaneously, you just flood them really. They'll be like, oh my god. And the worst thing is there are softwares out there that lets you do this very easily. It's almost like one click, five minutes, and you, your competitor is like, oh my god, my Zendesk tickets is like 1,000 a day. You know, just to click through and delete everything is going to take three hours of my time. Next, um, we have fake negative reviews. This is very straightforward. It's like just go to your competitor's eBay or Amazon page, buy something, and then just say, wow, that sucks. Okay, straightforward. <laughs> or like, wow, breaks down every single time I use it, blows up in my face, or something like that. Um, next, we have something very interesting called bandwidth drains. This is, might be confusing to some, but essentially, what you can do is, if you realize every single website has a bandwidth limit that they have. If they go past their bandwidth limit, they either pay more money or their entire website gets suspended. This is very normal for all websites out there. So what happens is, what if you create a, you have a software, you can just use a download manager 
and you download the same picture over and over again. You just drain their bandwidth. No matter how small that picture is, you just keep downloading it, and after a while, you'll see the whole website is just dead. It's like, I'm sorry, this website has been suspended due to abuse or something like that. If they're using Amazon Web Services, their bill is going to be through the roof because of the bandwidth charges. Um, next, um, there's negative spam link building. So what um, you know about Google is um, if you build spam links to your website, Google is going to penalize you for spam. Okay, Google is going to penalize you and yeah, you're going to rank lower. At the worst case scenario, you're going to be off Google. So if somebody searched your exact domain name, maybe say titanlee.com, please don't spam my domain anyway. If you type your own domain in and you don't get a search result, Google has banned you for life already. So that's really the worst thing that can happen. So what do I mean by negative spam link building? Is you build all these spam links for your competitors. You don't do them to yourself, you do them for your competitors and you let them get the damage by Google. Um, so this is something I coin myself, uh, Mafia Marketing. I don't think this is anywhere on the internet. Um, this is something that I came up with myself. So it's something that is important for everyone to know that there are bad people out there in the entire world. Not to say that I'm a bad guy, but there are bad people out there which you should take note of. And if possible, expose yourself to this kind of, um, kind of methodologies so that at least you know how to protect yourself. Okay? Um, essentially, the logic of mafia marketing is just to keep them busy, you know, firefighting. And that's all.